Section 18. Part 4 of Chapter 2 of the Commentaries on the Laws of England, Book 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. Commentaries on the Laws of England by William Blackstone. Book 1. Chapter 2, Part 4 The peculiar laws and customs of the House of Commons relate principally to the raising of taxes and the elections of members to serve in Parliament. First, with regard to taxes, it is the ancient indisputable privilege and right of the House of Commons that all grants of subsidies or parliamentary aids to begin in their House and are first bestowed by them. Although their grants are not effectual to all intents and purposes until they have the assent of the other two branches of the legislature. The general reason given for this exclusive privilege of the House of Commons is that the supplies are raised upon the body of the people, and therefore it is proper that they alone should have the right of taxing themselves. This reason would be unanswerable if the Commons taxed none but themselves, but it is notorious that a very large share of property is in the possession of the House of Lords, that this property is equally taxable and taxed as the property of the Commons, and therefore the Commons not being the sole persons taxed, this cannot be the reason of their having the sole right of raising and modelling the supply. The true reason, arising from the spirit of our Constitution, seems to be this. The Lords, being a permanent hereditary body, created at pleasure by the King, are supposed more liable to be influenced by the Crown, and when once influenced to continue so, than the Commons, who are a temporary elective body freely nominated by the people. It would therefore be extremely dangerous to give them any power of framing new taxes for the subject. It is sufficient that they have a power of rejecting, if they think the Commons too lavish or improvident in their grants. But so reasonably jealous are the Commons of this valuable privilege, that herein they will not suffer the other House to exert any power but that of rejecting they will not permit the least alteration or amendment to be made by the Lords to the mode of taxing the people by a money bill, under which appellation are included all bills by which money is directed to be raised upon the subject for any purpose or in any shape whatsoever, either for the exigencies of government and collected from the kingdom in general as the land tax, or for private benefit and collected in any particular district, as by turnpikes, parish rates, and the like. Yet Sir Matthew Hale mentions one case, founded on the practice of Parliament in the reign of Henry the Sixth, wherein he thinks the Lords may alter a money bill, and that is, if the Commons grant a tax, as that of tonnage and poundage, for four years, and the Lords alter it to a less time as for two years, here, he says, the bill need not be sent back to the Commons for their concurrence, but may receive the royal assent without farther ceremony, for the alteration of the Lords is consistent with the grant of the Commons. But such an experiment will hardly be repeated by the Lords under the present improved idea of the privilege of the House of Commons, and, in any case where a money bill is remanded to the Commons, all amendments in the mode of taxation are sure to be rejected. Next, with regard to the elections of knights, citizens, and burgesses, we may observe that herein consists the exercise of the democratical part of our Constitution, for in a democracy there can be no exercise of sovereignty but by suffrage, which is the declaration of the people's will. In all democracies, therefore, it is of the utmost importance to regulate by whom and in what manner the suffrages are to be given. And the Athenians were so justly jealous of this prerogative that a stranger who interfered in the assemblies of the people was punished by their laws with death, 
because such a man was esteemed guilty of high treason by usurping those rights of sovereignty to which he had no title. In England, where the people do not debate in a collective body, but by representation, the exercise of this sovereignty consists in the choice of representatives. The laws have therefore very strictly guarded against usurpation or abuse of this power by many salutary provisions, which may be reduced to these three points. 1. The qualifications of the electors. 2. The qualifications of the elected. 3. The proceedings at elections. 1. As to the qualifications of the electors. The true reason of requiring any qualification with regard to property in voters is to exclude such persons as are in so mean a situation that they are esteemed to have no will of their own. If these persons had votes, they would be tempted to dispose of them under some undue influence or other. This would give a great, an artful, or a wealthy man a larger share in elections than is consistent with general liberty. If it were probable that every man would give his vote freely and without influence of any kind, then, upon the true theory and genuine principles of liberty, every member of the community, however poor, should have a vote in electing those delegates to whose charge is committed the disposal of his property, his liberty, and his life. But, since that can hardly be expected in persons of indigent fortunes, or such as are under the immediate dominion of others, all popular states have been obliged to establish certain qualifications, whereby some who are suspected to have no will of their own are excluded from voting, in order to set other individuals, whose wills may be supposed independent, more thoroughly upon a level with each other. And this constitution of suffrages is framed upon a wiser principle than either of the methods of voting, by centuries or by tribes, among the Romans. In the method, by centuries, instituted by Servius Tullius, it was principally property and not numbers that turned the scale. In the method, by tribes, gradually introduced by the tribunes of the people, numbers only were regarded, and property entirely overlooked. Hence the laws passed by the former method had usually too great a tendency to aggrandize the patricians or rich nobles, and those by the latter had too much of a leveling principle. Our constitution steers between the two extremes. Only such as are entirely excluded, as can have no will of their own. There is hardly a free agent to be found but what is entitled to a vote in some place or other in the kingdom. Nor is comparative wealth or property entirely disregarded in elections. For though the richest man has only one vote at one place, yet if his property be at all diffused, he has probably a right to vote at more places than one, and therefore has many representatives. This is the spirit of our constitution, not that I assert it is in fact quite so perfect as I have here endeavoured to describe it, for if any alteration might be wished or suggested in the present frame of parliaments, it should be in favour of a more complete representation of the people. But to return to our qualifications, and first those of electors for knights of the shire. 1. By statute 8 Henry the Sixth, Chapter 7, and 10 Henry the Sixth, Chapter 2. The knights of the shires shall be chosen of people dwelling in the same counties, whereof every man shall have freehold to the value of forty shillings by the year within the county, which by subsequent statutes is to be clear of all charges and deductions except parliamentary and parochial taxes. The knights of shires are the representatives of the landholders or landed interest of the kingdom. Their electors must therefore have estates in lands or tenements within the county represented. These estates must be freehold, 
that is, for term of life at least, because beneficial leases for long terms of years were not in use at the making of these statutes, and copyholders were then little better than villains, absolutely dependent upon their lord. This freehold must be of forty shillings annual value, because that sum would then, with proper industry, furnish all the necessaries of life, and render the freeholder, if he pleased, an independent man. For Bishop Fleetwood, in his Chronicon Preciosum, written about sixty years since, has fully proved forty shillings in the reign of Henry the Sixth to have been equal to twelve pounds per annum in the reign of Queen Anne. And as the value of money is very considerably lowered since the bishop wrote, I think we may fairly conclude from this and other circumstances that what was equivalent to twelve pounds in his days is equivalent to twenty at present. The other less important qualifications of the electors for counties in England and Wales may be collected from the statutes cited in the margin, which direct, too, that no person under twenty-one years of age shall be capable of voting for any member. This extends to all sorts of members, as well for boroughs as counties, as does also the next, namely three, that no person convicted of perjury or subornation of perjury shall be capable of voting in any election. For that no person shall vote in right of any freehold granted to him fraudulently to qualify him to vote. Fraudulent grants are such as contain an agreement to reconvey or to defeat the estate granted, which agreements are made void, and the estate is absolutely vested in the person to whom it is so granted. And to guard the better against such frauds, it is farther provided, five, that every voter shall have been in the actual possession or receipt of the profits of his freehold, to his own use for twelve calendar months before, except it came to him by descent, marriage, marriage settlement, will, or promotion to a benefice or office. 6. That no person shall vote in respect of an annuity or rent charge, unless registered with the clerk of the peace twelve calendar months before. 7. That in mortgaged or trust estates, the person in possession under the above-mentioned restrictions shall have the vote. 8 that only one person shall be admitted to vote for any one house or tenement to prevent the splitting of freeholds. 9. That no estate shall qualify a voter unless the estate has been assessed to some land tax aid at least twelve months before the election. 10. That no tenant by copy of court roll shall be permitted to vote as a freeholder. Thus much for the electors in counties. As for the electors of citizens and burgesses, these are supposed to be the mercantile part or trading interest of this kingdom. But as trade is of a fluctuating nature, and seldom long fixed in a place, it was formerly left to the crown to summon, pro re natur, the most flourishing towns to send representatives to Parliament so that as towns increased in trade and grew populous, they were admitted to a share in the legislature. But the misfortune is that the deserted boroughs continued to be summoned, as well as those to whom their trade and inhabitants were transferred, except a few which petitioned to be eased of the expense, then usual, of maintaining their members, four shillings a day being allowed for a night of the shire, and two shillings for a citizen or burgess, which was the rate of wages established in the reign of Edward the Third. Hence the members for boroughs now bear above a quadruple proportion to those for counties, and the number of Parliament men is increased since Fortescue's time, in the reign of Henry the Sixth, from three hundred to upwards of five hundred, exclusive of those for Scotland. The universities were, in general, not empowered to send burgesses to Parliament, though once, in the twenty-eighth year of Edward I, when a Parliament was summoned to consider of the King's right to Scotland, 
there were issued writs which required the University of Oxford to send up four or five, and that of Cambridge two or three, of their most discreet and learned lawyers for that purpose. But it was King James I who indulged them with the permanent privilege to send constantly two of their own body to serve for those students who, though useful members of the community, were neither concerned in the landed nor the trading interest, and to protect in the legislature the rights of the Republic of Letters. The right of election in boroughs is various, depending entirely on the several charters, customs, and constitutions of the respective places, which has occasioned infinite disputes, though now by statute 2 George the Second, chapter 24, the right of voting for the future shall be allowed according to the last determination of the House of Commons concerning it and by statute 3 George the Third, chapter 15, no freeman of any city or borough, other than such as claim by birth, marriage, or servitude, shall be entitled to vote therein, unless he hath been admitted to his freedom twelve calendar months before. 2. Our second point is the qualification of persons to be elected members of the House of Commons. This depends upon the law and custom of parliaments, and the statutes referred to in the margin, and from these it appears, one, that they must not be aliens born or minors, two, that they must not be any of the twelve judges, because they sit in the Lord's house, nor of the clergy, for they sit in the convocation, nor persons attainted of treason or felony, for they are unfit to sit anywhere. 3. That sheriffs of counties, and mayors and bailiffs of boroughs, are not eligible in their respective jurisdictions as being returning officers, but that sheriffs of one county are eligible to be knights of another. 4. That, in strictness, all members ought to be inhabitants of the places for which they are chosen, but this is entirely disregarded. 5. That no persons concerned in the management of any duties or taxes created since 1692, except the commissioners of the Treasury, nor any of the officers following, namely commissioners of prizes, transports, sick and wounded, wine licenses, navy, and victualling, secretaries or receivers of prizes, controllers of the army accounts, agents for regiments, governors of plantations and their deputies, officers of Minorca or Gibraltar, officers of the excise and customs, clerks or deputies in the several offices of the treasury, exchequer, navy, victualling, admiralty, pay of the army or navy, secretaries of state, salt, stamps, appeals, wine licenses, hackney coaches, hawkers, and peddlers, nor any persons that hold any new office under the crown created since 1705 are capable of being elected members. 6. That no person having a pension under the crown during pleasure or for any term of years is capable of being elected. 7. That if any member accepts an office under the Crown, except an officer in the Army or Navy accepting a new commission, his seat is void, but such member is capable of being re-elected. 8. That all knights of the Shire shall be actual knights, or such notable esquires and gentlemen as have estates sufficient to be knights, and by no means of the degree of yeoman. This is reduced to a still greater certainty by ordaining 9, that every knight of a shire shall have a clear estate of freehold or copyhold to the value of £600 per annum, and every citizen and burgess to the value of £300, except the eldest sons of peers and of persons qualified to be knights of shires, and except the members for the two universities, which somewhat balances the ascendant which the boroughs have gained over the counties by obliging the trading interest to make choice of landed men, 
and of this qualification the member must make oath and give in the particulars in writing at the time of his taking his seat. But, subject to these restrictions and disqualifications, every subject of the realm is eligible of common right. It was therefore an unconstitutional prohibition which was inserted in the King's writs for the Parliament Holden at Coventry in the sixth year of Henry the Fourth, that no apprentice or other man of the law should be elected a knight of the shire therein. In return for which, our law books and historians have branded this Parliament with the name of Parliamentum Inductum, or the Lack Learning Parliament and Sir Edward Cook observes with some spleen that there was never a good law made thereat. 3. The third point regarding elections is the method of proceeding therein. This is also regulated by the law of Parliament, and the several statutes referred to in the margin, all of which I shall endeavour to blend together and extract out of them a summary account of the method of proceeding to elections. As soon as the Parliament is summoned, the Lord Chancellor, or if a vacancy happens during Parliament, the Speaker, by order of the House, sends his warrant to the Clerk of the Crown in Chancery, who thereupon issues out writs to the Sheriff of every county for the election of all the members to serve for that county, and every city and borough therein. Within three days after the receipt of this writ, the sheriff is to send his precept under his seal to the proper returning officers of the cities and boroughs, commanding them to elect their members, and the said returning officers are to proceed to election within eight days from the receipt of the precept, giving four days' notice of the same, and to return the persons chosen, together with the precept, to the sheriff. But elections of knights of the shire must be proceeded to by the sheriffs themselves in person at the next county court that shall happen after the delivery of the writ. The county court is a court held every month or oftener by the sheriff, intended to try little causes not exceeding the value of forty shillings, in what part of the county he pleases to appoint for that purpose. But for the election of knights of the shire it must be held at the most usual place. If the county court falls upon the day of delivering the writ, or within six days after, the sheriff may adjourn the court and election to some other convenient time, not longer than sixteen days, nor shorter than ten. But he cannot alter the place without the consent of all the candidates, and in all such cases ten days' public notice must be given of the time and place of the election and, as it is essential to the very being of Parliament that elections should be absolutely free, therefore all undue influences upon the electors are illegal and strongly prohibited. For Mr. Locke ranks it among those breaches of trust in the executive magistrate, which, according to his notions, amount to a dissolution of the government, if he employs the force, treasure, and offices of the society to corrupt the representatives, or openly to pre-engage the electors, and prescribe what manner of person shall be chosen, for thus to regulate candidates and electors, and new model the ways of election, what is it, says he, but to cut up the government by the roots, and poison the very fountain of public security. As soon, therefore, as the time and place of election, either in counties or boroughs, are fixed, all soldiers quartered in the place are to remove, at least one day before the election, to the distance of two miles or more, and not return till one day after the poll is ended. Riots, likewise, have been frequently determined to make an election void. By vote also of the House of Commons, to whom alone belongs the power of determining contested elections, no Lord of Parliament or Lord Lieutenant of a county hath any right to interfere in the election of commoners, and, by statute, the Lord Warden of the Cinque Ports shall not recommend any members there. 
If any officer of the excise, customs, stamps, or certain other branches of the revenue presumes to intermeddle in elections by persuading any voter or dissuading him, he forfeits a hundred pounds and is disabled to hold any office. Thus are the electors of one branch of the legislature secured from any undue influence from either of the other two, and from all external violence and compulsion. But the greatest danger is that in which themselves cooperate by the infamous practice of bribery and corruption, to prevent which it is enacted that no candidate shall, after the date, usually called the testy, of the writs, or after the vacancy, give any money or entertainment to his electors, or promise to give any, either to particular persons or to the place in general, in order to his being elected, on pain of being incapable to serve for that place in Parliament. And if any money, gift, office, employment, or reward be given, or promised to be given to any voter at any time, in order to influence him to give or withhold his vote, both he that takes and he that offers such bribe forfeits five hundred pounds, and is for ever disabled from voting and holding any office in any corporation, unless, before conviction, he will discover some other offender of the same kind, and then he is indemnified for his own offence. The first instance that occurs of election bribery was so early as the thirteenth year of Elizabeth, when one Thomas Long, being a simple man and of small capacity to serve in Parliament, acknowledged that he had given the returning officer and others of the borough of Westbury four pounds to be returned member, and was for that premium elected. But for this offence the borough was immersed, the member was removed, and the officer fined and imprisoned. But as this practice hath since taken much deeper and more universal root, it hath occasioned the making of these wholesome statutes, to complete the efficacy of which there is nothing wanting but resolution and integrity to put them in strict execution. Undue influence being thus, I wish the depravity of mankind would permit me to say, effectually, guarded against, the election is to be proceeded to on the day appointed, the sheriff or other returning officer first taking an oath against bribery and for the due execution of his office. The candidates, likewise, if required, must swear to their qualification, and the electors in counties to theirs, and the electors both in counties and boroughs are also compellable to take the oath of abjuration and that against bribery and corruption. And it might not be amiss if the members elected were bound to take the latter oath as well as the former, which in all probability would be much more effectual than administering it only to the electors. The election being closed, the returning officer in boroughs returns his precept to the sheriff with the persons elected by the majority, and the sheriff returns the whole, together with the writ for the county and the knights elected thereupon, to the clerk of the crown in chancery, before the day of meeting, if it be a new parliament, or within fourteen days after the election, if it be an occasional vacancy, and this under penalty of five hundred pounds. If the sheriff does not return such knights only as are duly elected, he forfeits, by the old statutes of Henry the Sixth, a hundred pounds, and the returning officer in boroughs, for a like false return, forty pounds, and they are besides liable to an action in which double damages shall be recovered by the later statutes of King William, and any person bribing the returning officer shall also forfeit three hundred pounds. But the members returned by him are the sitting members, until the House of Commons, upon petition, shall adjudge the return to be false and illegal. And this abstract of the proceedings at elections of knights, citizens, and burgesses concludes our inquiries into the laws and customs more peculiarly relative to the House of Commons. End of section 18. Recording by Graham Redman.